Big news! The new Sprint LTE Plus network is faster than Verizon and AT&T based on analysis of a recent study by Nielsen. And to celebrate, we're inviting you to join Sprint for the biggest offer in U.S. wireless history. Switch to Sprint and save 50% on most Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile rates. Yep, you heard that right. No gimmicks, no tricks. You have Verizon 6 gigs for $60, $30 with Sprint. And if you have 15 gigs for $100 from AT&T, $50 with Sprint. Even if you have T-Mobile's 10 gigs for $80, we'll give it to you for $40. And we won't force you to watch video in low def. Oh, and one more thing. We'll even pay your switching fees up to $650 per line so you can switch to the Sprint LTE Plus network today. Visit a Sprint store at Sprint.com slash save 50%. Offer coverage not available everywhere for discounted phones. Excludes taxes, surcharges, roaming, and premium content. Subject to new line $36 activation fee. Credit valid for in Plans may not be exact match. See website for eligible plans. Offer ends one 1818 Exclusions and restrictions apply. Contract by audio. Reward card requires online registration. Blog Talk Radio. We are the UR Tennis Network. Our mission is to be the voice of tennis. We enlist a team of passionate enthusiasts to promote our sport. We strive to bring interesting perspectives on the many spins of tennis. Our goal is to provide the learners of our sport with current news and information from many angles. We seek active participation from communities interested in tennis, but tennis is not interested in them. We are expanding our outreach. Tennis is a true lifetime sport that needs to be talked about. And the UR Tennis Network pledges to pursue this idea relentlessly. Good morning and welcome to the Parenting Aces radio show on Blog Talk Radio's UR Tennis Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. Sorry for the break last week, but I had all of my babies home and figured that I would take the week off from the show and just enjoy being with family. I hope you guys forgive me for that, and I hope you did the same, whether it was at a tournament or just hanging out at home or whether you escaped somewhere wonderful, (laughs) but I hope you all had a very happy Thanksgiving. We have a really interesting uh, show for you today, two phenomenal women who have dedicated their lives to the sport of tennis, both as players and now as coaches, and I'm really looking forward to hearing their stories of coming up as women in the sport and transitioning to the coaching side. Uh, They both have faced some challenges and overcome those challenges in a absolutely magnificent manner. So I think we're all going to learn quite a bit today about a different facet of the sport maybe than I'm normally presenting to you guys as the parent of a male tennis player. You know, I, I a lot of the time focus on that side of things. And so I think it will be very refreshing to hear how the women's side of the sport looks a little bit more. Before I bring them on, I want to go to a quick commercial, but when we come back, today's guests are Sarah Stone and Ann grossman Wonderlick, and we have just a fantastic show ahead. Morning. Orthopedic surgeons are seeing an increase in overuse injuries when young athletes perform the same repetitive, repetitive stressful motions over and over. Oh, oh, over. Pitching, tennis, weight training, even long swimming workouts can cause overuse trauma that may require surgery. If your kids play and train hard, visit orthoinfo.org or stopsportsinjuries.org. A message from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine. Welcome back to the Parenting Aces radio show on Blog Talk Radio's UR Tennis Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and we would love for you to call in and join the conversation today. If you are near a phone and care to join us, that number is 714-583-6853. Again, 714-583-6853. And as I mentioned before the break, we have with us today Sarah Stone and Ann Grossman Wonderlick, and they are two women who came up through the sport first as players and have now moved on to the coaching side of the game and offer a very unique perspective of what it's like to be a woman in the sport today. 
Um, just as a matter of a little background, the way I connected with Sarah is she and Ann started a Facebook group for women's tennis coaches and invited me to join the group just to kind of lurk and learn. And so we connected that way and I begged her to please come on the show and she agreed to do that. So I'm I'm very grateful to her. And with Anne, I actually met Anne for the first time at the U.S. Open last year in 2014. She was coaching a young woman, Fran Lorenzo, who was playing, and I had the opportunity to watch Fran play and to visit with Anne and actually to sit behind Anne during one of Fran's matches and, and watch and as she sat there as coach, and it was really interesting for me, and, and we've stayed in touch ever since then. So I'm just so thrilled to have them both with us today. Let me bring them both on the air. And ladies, welcome to the Parenting Aces show, and thank you both so much for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. So I'm going to start by asking each of you to just kind of give a, a summary of your experience in tennis, you know, how you got started as a player, and then how you made that transition into coaching. And Anne, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Well, um, honestly, uh, I'll just start from the very beginning. Um, I was in the French Open locker room and I had decided to retire from playing, and one of my uh, the former you know players that you know was there there with me. Uh, she uh, she was like, "What are you going to do? Are you going to teach tennis?" And I was like, "Absolutely not! I am not going <laughs> to teach tennis." And uh, anyway, to so but you know what? What I really realized is that when I when I you know kind of remove myself from the game, um, how much I really loved it. I, I really found out that I loved it more than I ever had. And um, so I got into teaching right away, right actually before I even retired from playing. Um, and uh, that's kind of how it all started. Uh, I think I've, I've grown more to love the game than I ever have um, b- by not being a player, actually. And And you're a parent now, and you've got one child who plays tennis, one child who plays golf, um, you know, was that were you an influence in their decisions, or did you just kind of let that happen organically? Um, I kind of let that just happen. Uh, my my oldest son, who's a golfer, he um, he actually picked up golf when he was two years old on his own, and he always played tennis, but he really gravitated towards uh, golf just because he was like, this is my thing. And you know his his dad is a swimmer. I was a tennis player, so golf was kind of like, oh, it's a t- completely different sport. Um, and then with my youngest son, it's actually uh, an unbelievable story on how he's playing tennis because he was actually playing uh, football, year-round swimming, and playing lacrosse. And tennis was was his fourth sport. And um, by another former coach who I completely respect and who I admire more than anybody. Um, Robert Lansdorp uh, saw, I, I had Ty go and see him after he'd only been playing tennis a year, and uh, he really is the one that um, persuaded him to, to, to completely quit all the other sports and play tennis. So it's a crazy story, and um, but Ty loves it more than more than anything. He's just thriving, and so he hasn't been playing, he's only been playing for about two and a half years, but uh I think without Robert, um, he would not be playing tennis. Interesting, interesting. And Sarah, how about you? How did you get started in the game as a player and then transition into coaching? Well, I started pretty young. I think I was maybe two or three. My dad's a tennis coach, and he's been at the same club for the last, uh, I think, 37 years in Australia. So uh, it was I guess it was just what we did. My whole family plays tennis and, um, you know, I, it, I didn't really enjoy playing that much at all. I was, a, I was a good junior, you know, I was in the Australian, uh, junior fed cup team and, you know, played the junior slams and stuff. And then I, every, every other 
probably a year I wouldn't want to play anymore because, I don't know, I guess it's just a lot because of what the other kids in America also face. It's it's difficult sometimes with the Federation. You know, I, I, was, I was part of it, but... I always felt like um, I only had one coach that I can look back on at a junior age who I'm still very close friends with and he works on the tour, who I actually enjoyed practicing with him. So for me, um, that was that was a very difficult thing about tennis. My dad was rough. I mean, you know, it's very difficult to coach your own kids. And uh, I know Anne has done a great job coaching Ty because Ty's amazing. I, I think this kid is amazing. I, I tell it put everything into this guy because he's going to be a superstar. But um, it's not easy. And, and I think that I didn't really, uh, you know, develop that love of the game. And I think parents, that's a really critical thing for parents to realise is that they have such a heavy influence on whether or not the kids are enjoying the sport purely by their questions about, you know, the last thing the kid wants to do is be grilled on the way home in the car. And the last thing they want to do is, be ha- scared to tell their parents, particularly girls, what their result of the practice matches were. For me, that was very difficult, and it's very difficult for me as a coach to get parents to understand the amount of stress that them grilling their results in practice brings to them. So uh, I played after juniors. I stopped playing for two years completely. Then uh, I had a friend that asked me to play some club matches in uh, Europe and I said, I haven't been playing. She said, you know, you'll be fine. We'll pay you. You'll be good enough. And then I just played uh, for about a year and a half after that with my friends. I just really played doubles and I played a couple of slams and then I'd had enough. I just didn't like, I just didn't like the sport as a player. And I actually transitioned straight into coaching because um, my doubles partner, Sam Stoza, didn't have a coach at the time and we'd already spent, you know, a year and a half traveling together and um, I said, well, you know, I can coach you and just kind of happened like that. So I was lucky to work with such a good player so soon at 21, but, you know, not everybody's past like that. So mine's a lot different than a lot of other people. So, yeah, that's that's my story. So you grew up, Sarah, with a male coach, and how about you? Did you grow up with a male coach or a female coach? I had a male coach. Um, actually, my dad was mainly my, my my coach, but I got started at a local club, and he was a male. Actually, he uh, was a former baseball player, um, and he made it really fun for me. And I honestly, I didn't start with private lessons. I just had like a little... And, you know, a uh, threesome with, you know, three, two other kids and me. So, and I just remember uh, if we had a great lesson that, uh, you know, we got a treat and it was always ice cream and that kept me <laughs> coming back for more. It was actually really simple. You know, actually when I was playing on tour, you know, I would always revert back to that because sometimes I would write down on a piece of paper if I was struggling, you know, why I play tennis, why I don't, why I don't want to play tennis. And, you know, it always came back to, like, you know, having fun and remember getting that ice cream. And I know it sounds kind of ridiculous, but, um, you know, those were those were very strong feelings I had at such a young age on the love of, of, of the game right there. So I think it's so important that, you know, um, people keep it, you know, to have fun. That's the most important thing. So, yeah, he was a male coach. And then my dad, my dad, who also worked with me every day, who was also very extremely uh, tough on me. And I had many of those uh, trips every single night in the car of my dad grilling me if I just had played, if I practiced badly. So I can, Sarah and I have, you know, she was in Australia and I'm in uh, Ohio. So, look. Uh, the same, uh, the same, uh, you know, story, right? <laughs> right, and I, I think it's universal. I mean, we hear this story constantly. I've, you know, I've interviewed players in college. I've interviewed players who are on in the juniors. I've interviewed professional players, and it all comes back to that same message that you have to have a passion for the sport, and parents leave your kids alone. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's not easy. Honest, it's not as easy yeah, as that. It's it's not because honestly, if I didn't have my dad, I mean, I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't have made it as a player. So I don't condemn my dad at all. It's just uh 
he was just doing the best that he could, and I think he was pushing me and to be to the, be the best that I could. But I mean, I just think that you know parents can learn; they have to be involved with their children. I mean, there's there's no way I would be doing what I'm doing right now if it wasn't for my father. So. It's just I think that they could just learn and listen to to people that have you know past experiences and that have been successful. So because your your parents are your bread and butter. My dad was my bread and butter. I mean I was 32 in the world after being on tour for a year and a half, two years, and he died, and uh, and I was splitting sets with all the top players in the world. So I really I really never found you know a coach that really believed in me and pushed me the way my dad could. So. Um, you need your parent. I never, you know, if I'm working with a child, I never want their parent to ever, like, not be a part of their life because it's, it's super important. With Francesca De Lorenzo, I mean, she was incredibly driven herself. She she was is probably one of the most competitive um, kids I've ever worked with, and that's why she's having the success she has. And her mom, literally, they let me do the coaching on the court. They literally left her alone. Now she's a different she's a different beast. You know what I mean? So I think you have to take a look at your child and just be like, you know, do I need to push them or do I not need to push them? And they didn't need to push Francesca, you know? So, um that's where they need to adapt. That's where parents need to adapt. Right. Well that makes sense. And I you know, it's very difficult. You know now that you your own kids are playing sports at a high level. Um <laughs> sometimes it's it's very hard to keep your mouth shut and just let them own the sport themselves and especially when you're spending exorbitant amounts of time and money to help them and you know so I think as a parent I feel like I'm constantly a work in progress I you know I'll have moments where I do really well, and then I have more moments that I do really, really badly. <laughs> and, you know, you wish you could just take those back, but it, and, it's all part and, I'm and no, parcel of I'm the process. No, yeah, I mean, I'm no angel. I've got two boys myself, you know, so I, I'm not going to say that I'm an angel either. You know what I mean? It's still a work in progress for me as a parent. So I'm also a coach on the, you know, for for my business side, and then I'm a parent, and then now I'm coaching my little guy. So believe me, I'm no angel. <laughs> but sometimes I sit back and I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I just do? You know. So um, it's okay. You know, you're gonna make mistakes, and there's no manual. You know, we don't have a manual sure. that if something breaks down, that you go to, right? <laughs> right. Right. So uh, let me ask both of you, do you feel like your experience coming up as a junior player and even once you started playing professionally would have been different if you had had a female coach? And if so, how? How would it have been different? Uh, Well, for me, I had female coaches. Um, I'm going to say that one of them was a very good player, very, very good, and uh, was part of my federation, and that did not make me enjoy tennis at all. So I, I really don't think I am a very... And Andrew, we're very strong advocates for females being involved in the sport when it's, when it's very uh, dictated by males. But I think it's not... For me, it's not a gender issue. For me, it's about the person... Um, just being wanting to be a teacher, wanting to do the job because they really want to make a difference. A lot of coaches get into coaching because they finish playing and you can make so much more money just going and doing lessons on a flexible schedule. And even if they've done degrees, I mean, if you're if you're an ex player and you have some sort of personality in the in the business world, you have to have a very, very good job to earn more money than you can ca- pretty much casually earn. If you, you know, after time, it might take you a minute to get involved in it, but to play, to coach tennis. So I think that one of the major issues is just the way that um, the way that coaches are with people. I, I mean, a couple of my female coaches I really loved, and a couple of my male coaches I really loved too. They weren't my private coach. I think the mistake that my dad made, and I agree with Anne, 
your parents, like my dad was super hard on me, but you have to have someone being tough on you because that's the only, really the only way you succeed, in, probably in my opinion. I don't know about Anne's, but you also need someone in there that the, the parents trust that creates it like a safe environment where, you know, even with that pushing going on, you can still feel like you're enjoying it. So I, I really think it's just about understanding how to communicate with girls. It, it is more difficult, I think, because there's this thing where, in general, women personalise things more. And so it can be more difficult to communicate direct uh information to those players because they think oh aren't I good enough I know men do it too but I found I've coached a lot of girls and and girls are more uh, in general more complicated to coach and you you just can't coach everybody the same so I, I don't I think girls just get that more as people because more often than not we are like that so that actually makes it easier for girls to coach girls than it does for guys to coach girls. And I don't know, what do you think about that, Anne? I mean, personally, when I coach a female, I just can feel them and understand how they're feeling that day. So I just go with that. It's not that, you know, there's some magical, I I, I guess just me being a female, I I know when to push hard and I know when to lay off. I know, like, you know, how they're feeling that day. I just, I, 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 I can't explain it. Um, (laughs) <laughs> it just kind of I go with my gut and I can read people really well. It's maybe why I made it professionally on tour because I know what that girl is thinking on the other side when to like, you know, keep pushing and not, you know, not not have a have a setback on the court or you know what I mean, just just keep grinding, okay, I'm breaking her down. It's the same way same way with coaching. I just okay Okay, you know, except then I, I'll lay off if I'm working with her and maybe all oh, something is happening and, you know, she's not, she's getting a little irritated. Okay, I step back and I just don't press. You know what I mean? It's not, I'm very tough on the court. I'm extremely tough. Okay. Yeah, she's tough. I mean, Sarah can, <laughs> she's seen me in action. So it's she's not amazing. like, you know, I'm just. <laughs> But anyway, I think that's the difference on having a female coach working with a female player. What, I mean, there are a lot of stories that come out, and I, you know, I I don't want to get too detailed, but we have heard on more than one occasion of misconduct happening between a male coach and teenage female players. And... I always said, you know, from the time my son started going to tournaments with a coach instead of with me going, um, I was really relieved that I had a boy instead of a girl because I would be a nervous wreck sending my daughter off to a tennis tournament with a group of male coaches. How can female coaches kind of get that message across to parents or is it a message that needs to be communicated more? Is it a message that parents need to be more aware of? What What are y'all's feelings on that? I mean, I, 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 mean, I saw it. I took Francesca to the French Open juniors this year and, I mean, I saw really, I, I saw some bad things, you know, Um I just I don't know if they're aware of it. Uh, they might look the other way, but I think they do need to realize that things things happen out there. You know, I mean, it's uh, it's kind of scary. You're right; it is very scary, and I don't I'm not sure if if, if parents are aware of it. Is there yeah. something that that you would? advise parents to do in preparation or are there you know signals to look out for or anything that you've seen or experienced yourselves that that you can share maybe their family life and 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 what they have in their life besides just being a tennis coach do they have a family are they married you know i don't know what about you sarah uh well i mean you know, I grew up with a guy in Australia, uh, and he was a super nice guy, and uh, he was about five, six years older than me, and 
Um, I would never have expected that, but when he was uh, in charge of, as a federation coach in Australia, um, he was having a sexual relationship with a 14-year-old player that was in the federation for two years, and you, he was he was married. His wife was expecting a baby. I mean, I think on one side I, I agree with what you're saying, and that um, I think that the and he's in jail, so <laughs> that's an example. But um, these things, they happen. I know some other, you know, some other cases in the United States. It's not, you know, not for me to do police report here, but I think that um, generally this this situation happens with with younger coaches. Um, yeah. I think the fam- younger male coaches, and you know what, it could happen with a younger female coach as well. I mean, it's not just exclusively a male thing. It could it could be either or. All, but I think that what's really important is that the parents have to um, under like know their kids. You know, they have to know what their kids are up to. It's the same in in life, and they have to. Um, you can't always go on other people what they say about the coach because it could be a first time thing, but. Uh, one thing that's expensive is to hire uh, to pay for another room. Like, you know, it's really they should be sh- the coaches should be sharing with another um, coach. But you know, when I've gone a couple of junior trips, I've I've stayed with the kids in the room, and obviously, you know, that's that's more fine in society. But I think that um, that you're, it's a dangerous situation, and I have male. Uh, coach friends that won't stay with players, obviously for that reason. And then the players, the coach, the family thinks, well, you know, that's another thousand dollars a week. Oh, maybe I can't take a coach. So it's definitely an extremely expensive sport. And I, I probably, I don't know. I, I would just try and, if I had a guy, have an, I have an older guy. And not that that's going to change it either, because I know another guy in jail who was older too. So. <laughs> I don't know, but that's what I think. I don't know what you you guys think about that, but separate rooms for sure, and that would be a good starting point. I, you know, it's funny because I, I think it all comes back to having these conversations between the parents, you know, the if if it's a two-parent household, the two parents having the discussion and being aware that this happens out there and, you know, just making sure that they understand that, that this goes on and then also yeah. having the conversation with with the junior player um you know making sure that the player knows that the parents are in her corner if something does go on that is not okay um that the parents are going to be supportive of their child and not take the side of the coach and you know, these conversations happen, like you said, they they have to happen in all aspects of raising children. But I think especially if, if we're sending our child on a trip with an adult coach, whether it is male or female, these conversations have to happen ahead of time so everybody is open about it and prepared, you know, in the rare event that something horrible does go on. Mm-hmm. I think you can talk to your child a lot like, you know, it's pretty obvious if, if they, um, well, okay, maybe that's not fair, but if they start to communicate differently about their coach, if they start to be a little bit more secretive, if they act weird, like I think a lot of parents just get too busy. They send it, you know, they, they're doing their job and, and these things can happen not just with, with tennis coaches. I, I just think it's, it's just a possibility in real life. I think that parents definitely have to be more aware and I, and I also think one of the most difficult things I've had with working with junior parents is they don't know their kids. I mean, they, they all tell me one thing that their opinion of what their kid is doing socially outside of tennis, that they're an angel and I'm not sure if sometimes <laughs> they're in denial about it, but the, there's some kids out there that are really doing the wrong thing badly and and it's it's a difficult conversation because a lot of parents just don't want to hear that like even if you tell them and then coaches won't sometimes really want to tell them because they'll be worried about you know well that could impact me financially and things like that I really think that it's the parent's job 
to know their kids because this could happen with a teacher at school. It could happen anywhere and, and, and it's really, they're responsible for their children and these kids are they're young and, you know, they might, they might love the attention that they're getting from, let's say the coach is a 35-year-old male and the girl is 17. I mean, that, that is a realistic possibility that some way that there could be some sort of connection there and, and some people would, some coaches would cross that line and they, they are in the position of power, so they, they shouldn't. But that's where I think the parent has to really be paying attention. Parents spend so much time paying attention to, like, results. Did they win? Did they lose? Are they trying? Why is their elbow so high on their forehand? You know, shouldn't they be contacting the ball further in front? If they would just forget all that stuff and just focus on their, their, their kid as a human being, the whole picture would be easier for everybody. That's a great point and great advice and much easier said than done. And, and now that, you know, you're coaching your son, I'm sure you'd agree. It's, it's very difficult to, you know, stay focused on your child's human development when so much of the focus is around their tennis development. Yeah, true, but I also think that character is, like, the number one thing that I want my kids to have great character out there and to, I, I mean, I, 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 I'm i a parent first, right? Tennis yeah. came a long way after. So for me, you know, I always, if it's a teacher in school and they say, oh, my child is doing this, I am going to take that teacher's side and be like, okay, you know what I mean? Because... And it's the same. It's happened to me on the tennis court as well, right? I'll I'll tell the parent, oh, your child is being like this, but they'll take the child's side. It's the same exact thing. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I, um, I see a lot of parents that don't want to believe that their kids are doing anything wrong, that they're angels. And, um, and I, that's our society now, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. And, you know, nobody wants to – own up to anything or take responsibility. We always we all like to place the blame elsewhere. Um, but I think when, especially when it comes to a coach-player relationship, that we parents need to be very diligent about keeping our eyes open. And Sarah, I thought what you said was really important for people to hear that, you know, pay attention if your child starts talking differently about their coach or acting differently before practices or after practices, that could be a really clear signal that something is amiss. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, if they're if they're starting to spend time in, uh, like, doing, let's say, um, match video reviews at the coach's house or all sorts of situations that you just would, if you stop and look and look at the whole situation, you need to say, okay, if you get that feeling of, oh, why are they going to do that? I mean, you, you can't just brush those kinds of things off. I mean, you know, at, if their teacher says they're coming to school late or they're coming in late from lessons or they there's a lot of things, and I think that um, sometimes in these situations, parents get so wrapped up in the results. And this is, these situations are very rare, but, uh, you know, obviously Anne and I know of them, but um, I think that they, people tend to just uh, ignore things that they, that they don't want to focus on, and they, they really do get wrapped up in whether or not, okay, well, they're winning, you know, it's okay, oh, well, they're probably just, you know, need a little bit more time to watch the video or, you know, mm-hmm. if girls are wearing more makeup for their lessons and things like that. I really think <laughs> little mascara, a little extra mascara. Right, <laughs> if they start doing that or if there's another, if there's a boy there that's, you know, that's taking lessons, okay, you you should be okay. But, you know, I, I just think that that's a lot of, I watch, I read a lot about this just in general life and I think that now people live very busy lives now they're on their phones all the time. They're not paying attention. And it's, it's really important. And it's, it's also really important for them to pay attention just in general because tennis is, like, I think Anne does a really good job with Ty. 
I think she's a, a, a fantastic coach. I coach Alexa Glass. She plays on the WTA Tour, and, and I called Anne as a coach myself to get her extra, like, such a high-level ex-player input into the situation. So I can speak for Anne's work on the court, and I've watched Thai play matches with Anne there. And she's, she's very aware of, like, the certain ways that a parent is going to instinctively respond that a coach wouldn't because it's more personal for you guys in that situation. But if you have some tools, if parents have some tools, like I suggested to the parents that I was working with that he, this is the rule. If you start watching the match, you cannot move. You have to, you have to stay there. And then I'll, then I'll sometimes hear things like, oh, well, you know, they like it when I leave and, and things like this. But they, then they say, well, I know my child. But really they just kind of know, like they don't take an honest look at, at their, their critical role in the situation. The parent's role, as Anne said, is absolutely critical from 10 years old until number one in the world. It's, it's huge. You need the support. You need the push. And I think from that point, and some ex-players really messed that up, but Anne is very aware of that, that you have to be tough and you have to realise where, okay, everyone is human. You know, sometimes people overstep and sometimes the, the kid, you know, answers back and they shouldn't have. But I don't know. I just think it's really important to be aware of behaviour. I like it when the parent is on the court, actually, because they need yeah, to understand what is going on. Like if, well, you're a rare coach to say that. If, well, that's because most coaches are afraid, and they <laughs> that's the bottom line. They're afraid, and maybe they just don't want to work that hard because they don't that's want to my work feeling. Hard. That's what it is. <laughs> they want to sit They're, down and take breaks. Yeah, and let's uh, let's pick up some balls yeah. for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true, and 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 is absolutely right. But in in another instance. Sometimes there's, I've only ever had one parent that I didn't want to be there, and I've and only one out of all the kids I've ever coached because it was so detrimental to the kid, and that it was just constant talking to the kid and putting them down, and I just felt like the kid was so flat and it was draining all of my energy to even be on the court that I said you can't come to practice anymore. Otherwise, I want to engage them. I want to explain this is what we're working on because if you give them the information then they don't go on the internet and come and you know show me well Roger Federer does this and his arm's straight and like why is my daughter um got a platform sir I mean Serena has a step up if you empower them and work with them then it's easy but then you know there's coaches that just don't really want to work hard on the other side that don't want the parents there because they just want to take your money. There's two sides. Yeah, I mean, for I, sure. Honestly, maybe maybe I've just haven't haven't really had any problems because they know that I'm tough, and they don't want to get in my way. Number one, you know, because I, I just I, I really I have oh, geez I've been coaching since 1998, and I would say teaching because I'm a teacher first. Um, right. And I, I, I guess maybe I just haven't really ever had that problem because I put everything into every single lesson and uh, and they trust me and they know that I work hard and um, they respect me. I mean, maybe maybe sometimes the, the parents don't respect the coach that much and then they have to, like, get out there and get crazy or something. I don't know, you know? Sure. Well, South what? Florida is worse than anywhere. South Florida <laughs> is a nightmare. South Florida is worse is is the worst place I've ever coached for the parents because um, Anne and I both taught in Colorado and I, and as I said, I've only had one parent I didn't want on the court at all. But um, I think that, you know, it's, it's really difficult here in South Florida because people, they think that they will move here and their kid is going to be the next Players who have moved here, Sharapova, Ishikori, Roddick, different players have come. A lot of players come here and they are looking for this magical wand and then when their kid isn't having the results, you know, they get really impatient. But I think that overall, you, if you're honest and you're tough, and the one thing that parents really want is they just want to be heard. And a lot of coaches 
just want to take, if you have a coach that just takes your money but won't take your phone calls, you should get another coach. That's my opinion because, you know, parents just want to be able to communicate and a lot of coaches think the minute they step off the court, it's over, but it's not really over. Interesting. I, I'd love to switch gears because I know, Sarah, you're going to have to hop off uh, shortly. I, I want to talk about this Facebook group that you guys developed and what was kind of the impetus behind feeling like you needed a place for female coaches and coaches of female players to gather together? Sarah, go ahead. <laughs> well... You know, it's something that I've thought about for the last, oh, I don't know, 10 years. <laughs> so um, I really felt like um, the coaches, coaches of female players, um, there isn't a support network globally for that. There are a couple of professional coaching associations. Um, statistically, just purely from a statistic that I know in Australia, only 20% of registered Tennis Australia coaches are female. Um, a lot of coaches think it's like a second position to work with a female, male coaches. You know, I can't speak for all of them, but they would, you know, if they could be offered the, let's say, the head coach job at Stanford or they could be offered the head coach job as, as the males or the females, they would think it's it's second class or a demotion to be in the, in the female position. So I think there, there are, are a lot of coaches out there that actually like to work with females. And from a female, from, from Anne and myself, I, I'll speak for Anne for a second. I don't know if she thinks that, but you, it's very apparent whether or not um, a, a male or female coach understands how to work well with girls. And I think, and they enjoy it. And I think that the more we can promote that and that they feel like that that's just as good a job as working with guys, um, I think that we can improve the game. For me, I've, I've spent more time on with the professional side of coaching for the last few years and now I've brought Anne into it, so I'm excited about that. But I see that the, the standard of coaching on the female tour is quite low. Um, it's a lot of people who would probably prefer to work with men, but they aren't good enough to get jobs with men. So they stay on the female tour. And I think that if we get together and we actually have uh, a group, like a forum, where there's people who are passionate about coaching females particularly, I mean, they can enjoy coaching males, but it's, it's a different type of coaching in some ways um, that I think that that would help bring up the overall level of the game. I mean, it's, it's a great game, but when I... Just for example, yesterday, um, since we formed this group together, because we, I really like Anne, I think she's brilliant, you know, she's a great girl, great coach, great experience. Uh, for me, a, an amazing partner to do this with. I mean, I feel very lucky. She has a diff totally different outreach to me. I've joined a couple of these forums just to read about what these people are commenting on. They slam women's tennis constantly. It doesn't matter how good the female is. You know, yeah, I, I, we had a debate about um, serve, just when is a female serve considered a weapon by people? Like, when will they give it the credit that it's a weapon? Lasicki clearly has a serve that is a weapon. And she, she can serve 131. And then one of the ex-male players commented that he, he said that the radar gun was probably rigged. I mean, I've seen Lasicki <laughs> play a lot at a lot of tournaments. Her serve is huge, you know. I've right. seen Leighton Hewitt play at a lot of tournaments. His serve is not huge. I just think that the, that women need to also support women and male male feminists need to support women's sport. And and these guys are saying like, who? Please list your favourite male and female, uh, the best ever college players. And there was seven comments in a row of only males. And then, I, and then I wrote on there, um, has anybody on here heard of Lisa Raymond? I'm, I can't tell you for sure, but I don't think Lisa even ever lost a match in college in two years. Doesn't even get a mention. So the general conversation is constantly about Federer's forehand or, 
you know, male strokes. And, and I think, you know, we have a really great game. We, like women's tennis, you know, it's not only when Serena plays, but what men don't understand is with equal pay, it's equal pay, where does the money come from that supports tennis? The money comes from TV revenue. And when the viewership is higher in female matches than male matches, actually, if you want to go on that, where the money's coming from, then women should be getting paid more than men. So it's just the idea was, was really just to start pushing forward that this is a really good game and you guys can educate yourselves how to be better coaches than the female players. And I think that, you know, that for us that's a passion and, and we're pretty excited just to be able to try and make a difference in the sport. I mean, there's, there's, so, many, there's so many female coaches out there, former players or just females in general that love the sport and are coaching, and nobody knows about them. You know, they're all over the world, and uh, that, that's what we want to do. We want to promote it. We want to promote them. Well, I know, and, you know, one of the first conversations you and I had was about the challenges you face as a female coach in this sport. And I think it's so interesting. You know, I it never occurred to me again, you know, I have a son who plays. He has only had male coaches through his development, and... You know, it's not a purposeful choice. It's just the way things happened. But, you know, I I, I have been shielded from the female side of the sport other than my limited experience as a junior player, and I wasn't very good, so we won't even talk about that. But, um, I, you know, I find it so interesting that that there is this huge gap between well, the level of respect and... And the level I can guarantee of... you. I'm sorry. I, I can guarantee. I can guarantee you that uh, if if I if you took my credentials, everything that I've accomplished in my sport, and if I was a guy, I probably would get be getting paid so much more than what I make. That's that's for sure. That's right? for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> so I think that's um, that's that's very difficult for me to sometimes just swallow, you know, I really just am like, you know what, if I was a guy, I would be treated like a king, but because I'm a female, this is, this is how people treat me. And it's very, I keep going because it got me out of where I came from. I grew up on a farm. I didn't have much. It was my ticket out of there. And I love the game, you know, and I want to give back and, and, and help kids. And it's really fun for me. So, but sometimes I'm just like, you know what? This is ridiculous. Sometimes I want to walk away, but then it just pulls me back in. So, <laughs> because you know what? Because I'm good at it, and I'm really good at it, and I She's really and good kids at it. improve. So <laughs> that's why I keep doing it. It's my niche. Okay. So, what's it gonna take for things to change? Uh, well, teamwork. <laughs> Teamwork. Yeah. Anne, Anne and I have formed a pretty good team. I think that we've had. Um, she has. She has definitely different. A few different friends to me. You know, we're we're not far apart in age, but we're a little bit. So we have different. We have different uh, friends that have played. Um, so I think that it it takes it takes a huge uh, shift, and and that comes with numbers coming together. Um, so. I think that uh, she she chatted to her friend Marianne Wardell about um, being part of what we want to do. And me, for example, I grew up in Australia. I I, I didn't know Marianne. I I had no idea, and that is scary. Before I came to the United States, I didn't even know. I love Kathy Rinaldi. She's what you know one of my favorite coaches. I've ne- I had never even heard of her, and she was top ten in the world. So here we have this. WTA tour that doesn't do quite a good enough job at promoting all players and they're aware of it you know they're they're starting to try to bring in the rising stars and there's this whole debate about what's going to happen after the Serena factor are we going to have a sport well you know what makes people famous is is media so I think that what what we can do is start to say listen this Marianne Wardell she made the 
semi-finals of the Australian Open. She was number 20 in the world. Christina Brandy is coaching in Tampa. In, 2000, in the year 2000, she was ranked number 27 in the world. You know, I speak to female players on the tour in the top 200, top 100, and often because, you know, I've, I've coached for a while and Alexa has a lot of friends, they might ask me, oh, can you recommend a coach? And I said to one of them, well, I've got a, I've got a friend in Belgium. She was, she, you know, she was a really good player. She's been coaching 43 in the world. Uh, I don't know. If I said to them, go to, you know, what about Anne? You know, what about Christina? These guys were top 30 in the world. Uh, so it's, it's just the reputation. So I think that if we can start to put the word out there, like the guys on the tour, and it's, you don't have to be the best player. I'm not saying that. But there are guys on the tour that cannot warm a coaches, male coaches, cannot warm a player up from the service line. Can you please explain to me how that they would be better than Anne or Christina Brandy or Patty Fendick, who, you know, was at, at Texas. You know, she, she was top 20 in the world as well. These guys are all coaches. Debbie Graham is a coach who is top 10 in the world. Surely they have had some, you know, experience and they get it, but there isn't a, a place recognizing them as their status as coaches. Like Pat Summit has done amazing things in basketball. She's a celebrity. And in other sports, male coaches are, are a celebrity, but nobody is promoting those coaches in women's tennis. Not even females. It doesn't matter. No one is promoting them about what a, what a great job they're doing just as sports people. So we're working together right i now. love it yes yeah. i love it i mean i think you're right i think it's a messaging problem i think you know it's a pr issue and hopefully the wta will will step up their efforts as a result of of what you guys are doing through facebook yeah, we're going to start, um, we're putting together a website that, you know, that takes a little bit of time because we have to speak to coaches individually and say, are you in, you know, is this a vision that you see? Do you want to be part of what we want to do? And you know, we could throw up a website with six coaches registered on there and it doesn't have much power, you know, probably together talk to about 150 in the last two weeks and there's only so much time since... You know, Anne has a lot of things going on, and I, I've had some things going on too. So we're we're moving forward. We've got um, people in uh, one coach who's uh, in Serbia, another guy in Belgium, another coach in Belgium. We want to get a global thing happening because it, this is a global issue. It's not just actually in America. It's almost better than anywhere. Some countries are better than others. Australia's pretty poor with it. Um, what I hear oftentimes is. Uh, particularly my dad, for example, I said to him, why don't you have a female coach? And he said, I can't find one. I said, you've got to be kidding me. You know, he said I, he loves having female coaches um, because they're so great with the kids, he always tells me. And <laughs> I think that if we can provide, um, and they, they, they oftentimes uh, have more empathy and they connect with the little kids more and things like that, not always, but... I think it's definitely, you know, we live in a world that's 50-50. I mean, the staff should probably be 50-50 if it's like a real world. And right. I think that there's not a place where female coaches can be um, found. And so when they want to go for a job, there's not like a, a database of, of girls and how do they become known. And I think that is, Anne and I both, um, and I know this from Anne, we've never had any problems getting any jobs. You know, we're both very confident and we, we, we have experience and we, we back our own opinions um, and, and we don't care about the, 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 you know, the world that doesn't support female coaches. We're going to do our thing anyway, but not everybody is that strong and not everybody has to be that strong. They shouldn't need to be to have these positions, but um, employers also need to know where do I find these people, you know? Mm -hmm. So right. that's that's another reason for why we want to have that database and that support system is to when people want to say, hey, do you do you know a female coach who'd be great? We can say, yeah, easy, you know, because 
they, it's almost like they're silent. They're living in an underground. You know, nobody knows where to find them. They're there. There's plenty of them, but nobody knows what they're doing. So if we can expose that and we can promote them, um, this is like not for profit for us. We, it's just for the, for actually just for females and for females getting ahead in women's coaching but also for having the right males in women's coaching, I think is really important. So for parents who are listening to this this broadcast, if if they have a daughter and they're interested in, in finding a top-level coach for their daughter, whether it be a male or a female, would you guys be okay with them contacting you? And, and if so, what's the best way for them to reach out? Uh, well, I would just send everybody to Anne because I think she's she could turn <laughs> she could turn you know a rock into gold like like snap. But um, I think that that we that, so one one of the things with coaching, which what people don't understand, is that you have to. It's kind of like this million dollar matchmaker with Patty, right? You have to know which coach is going to work well with which person. It's not always the fault of the coach, and it's not always the fault of the kid. But you have to have somebody who can, what Anne's saying is read those people and understand, like, who's going to work well with them, what, you know, what's going to motivate them, where are they going to get along. And when, when players ask me, you know, who do, they, who do I think, I make a decision based on that I think that I know that coach, I know their skills, I know that the player, if they have technical flaws, if they're you know, if they get emotional, if there's all sorts of pieces, which personality is going to suit that kid? Do they need a better serve? Is that coach good with serve? I think that those things um, is is a way that we're able to play that kind of matchmaker role because we can get that information and make a good good decision because otherwise you see there's coaches complaining that players hop from coach to coach to coach to coach I mean, I know that happens a lot, but nobody would stay in a relationship that they felt like was just a disaster. They would move on. And I think that that's why parents make the wrong decision based on how another player was successful with that coach or based on how good a player that coach was and think that that's just going to work. It just doesn't work like that. I mean, you know, Anne has a, a personality that is is very uh, like a teacher that can adapt to multiple different sorts of kids and different ways of learning. But some coaches are very, very rigid in that this is their way and you do it this way or or this is how I make champions and this is the way it works. But that's that's not real life. And and for the one kid that they produce, they'll burn a thousand. So I think part of what if parents talk to us, they can contact us through through our Facebook. Um, They can write us a message. I've had people in India writing to me already for the same thing. It's not a problem. I mean, we'd be more than happy because the level of tennis goes up to help anyone in that situation avoid a disastrous coaching situation. Because at 16, if you lose a year, you you really are in trouble, not only as a pro, but also as getting those good D1 scholarships. It could be over. It's a short window. Right. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate that. And and to my listeners, if if you need to know how to reach out to either Sarah or Anne, you know how to get to me. So get to me and I'll forward your information to these two awesome coaches and they'll be in touch with you. So ladies, I appreciate that very much. No problem. Thank you for having us. Yeah, well, we're down to just our last couple minutes. I I wanted to just make sure that you guys have gotten to address everything that you wanted to address today, and if there are any last words of wisdom you'd care to share, now's the time. I'm going to give that one to Anne. She's... Jeez, I don't know. You mm-hmm. know what? I think I, right. I, I, people should just go with their gut. Parents should go with their gut because you got to go with your first instinct and, and, and trust that because uh, if you overthink it, then um, you might get yourself into trouble. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure, especially with the, um, you know, you, you just don't want to get caught up in um, that maybe – you know, the kids having good results or you think that other players have had really good results with that coach. It doesn't mean 
that your kid is going to work well with that situation. You know, you really have to rely on your gut instinct about, you know, is this, does this feel right? And I think more, more often than not, that's your best bet. When you start to think about it, you overanalyze it and all these pieces of information come in and then, then you make the decision based on other facts but not what actually feels right for you. Well, that's great so, advice. I, again, thank you both so much for being with us this week. And to my listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. The podcast will be online later this afternoon at parentingaces.com, so I hope you will share it with your tennis friends. And uh, best of luck to Sarah and Anne. I, I know you guys are going to make some big changes, and I, I really look forward to following your progress. Thank Thanks, Lisa. you, Lisa. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next week on Parenting Aces. Big news. The new Sprint LTE Plus network is faster than Verizon and AT&T based on analysis of a recent study by Nielsen. And to celebrate, we're inviting you to join Sprint for the biggest offer in U.S. wireless history. Switch to Sprint and save 50% on most Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile rates. Yep, you heard that right. No gimmicks, no tricks. You have Verizon 6 gig for $60, 30 with Sprint. And if you have 15 gigs for $100 from AT&T, 50 with Sprint. Even if you have T-Mobile's 10 gig for $80, we'll give it to you for 40 And we won't force you to watch video in low def. Oh, and one more thing. We'll even pay your switching fees up to $650 per line so you can switch to the Sprint LTE Plus network today. Visit a Sprint store or Sprint.com slash save 50%. Offer coverage not available everywhere for discounted phones. Excludes taxes, surcharges, roaming, and premium content. Subject to new line $36 activation fee. Credit valid for day. Plans may not be exact match. See website for eligible plans. Or offer end 1716-721818. Exclusions and restrictions apply. Contract by order. Reward card requires online registration.